So we're going to we're going to continue from where we left off yesterday. So yesterday we learned about how we can solve equations by using or solve logarithmic and exponential equations. Now this is just a continuation of yesterday. It has the same title and objective. So just continue from where you left off. Oh, uh oh. And the U.S. attendance. Go. All right. So, So we'll just continue where we left off yesterday with another example. That is not the correct. Hold on, I'm just getting to the right page of the book here. There we go. Okay. So let's go ahead and solve. No, oh, this marker's dead. Okay, so let's go ahead and solve e to the x minus e to the negative x over 2 equals 1. Okay, so now when we, so we want to solve this. Now we have a little bit of a problem. So solving means isolating x, right? So when we're done, we're going to have x a number. But here's a problem. Our x's are inside these exponentials, e to the x. So we need to come up with some way to get rid, to pull those e to the x's outside, or those x's outside of the e to the x. Now the good news is, is we actually already have a method for doing so. We have if we could rewrite this, this equation as e to the x equals some number, then we could just turn it into log base e of that number equals x. Our x wouldn't be, our x would be on its own and we would be done. But we can't just do that yet. We can't use either of these properties yet. We can't use either of these properties yet. It's not in the form of just exponential equals exponential. So we can't use this form to the one to one property. And we can't use this form yet either because this, you can only change from this to this if that's all you have. You have e to the x equals a number or base to the whatever equals. So what we need to do is we need to figure out a way that we can write this as e to the x equals seven. Now buckle up because this is going to be a little bit of a journey. I'm going to leave a vacant corner here because when we're done doing, so what we're actually going to do is we're going to do two things. First, we're going to do this using algebra and it's going to be a pain in the butt. And then I'll show you a better way. 
a way that you can do this by graph. But I want you to really appreciate how much of a pain in the butt doing this with algebra is. Okay, let's get to it. So if e to the x minus e to the negative x over two equals five. Well, first things first, that two is annoying. So I'll multiply both sides by two. Now we have e to the x minus x, or e to the x minus e to the negative x. Easy enough. Now remember that if we could rewrite this as e to the x equals number, or e to the something equals number, then we can just use the uh, logarithm exponential form, form chain formula to solve. So we need to somehow combine these two. Well, the bad news is that it's impossible. We can't combine. But I need to come up with something more creative. So, now check this out. I'm going to do something interesting. So, first, I'm going to go ahead and I'll go ahead and subtract 10 from both sides. Well, you know what? I'll do that. Okay. So, look at what happens if I multiply both sides by e. The right side becomes e to the x. Then we can distribute in here. This is what it is. e to the x times e to the x is e to the x squared, isn't it? Anything times itself is that thing squared? And we could use the uh, power of a power property to rewrite this as e to the 2x, but that's actually not really going to be super useful for us, so I'll leave it like this. And e to the x times e to the negative x. Well, we're multiplying two powers together. They have the same base, which means that we can add their exponents. x minus x is 0, so it'd be e to the x squared minus e to the 0. And e to the 0, of course, is 1. Now, gather all of these terms on one side. And now we have e to the x squared. So I'll go ahead and subtract e to the x. Because I don't have to here. And we end up with e to the x squared minus that e to the x minus e to the 0 equals 0. And e to the 0 is 1. OK. Hey, wait a minute. They, oh, there was a 10. There was a 10. I totally forgot about that 10. Just kind of fell off. Minus, so we're actually subtracted. Subtracted 10 e. E minus 10. There we go. All right. So, thing squared minus 10 times a thing minus a number. This actually behaves a lot like, this looks a lot like a quadratic. In fact, if we let e to the x equal to w, Then we have w squared minus 10w minus 1 equals 0. Hey, I guess we could, we could factor this thing. Or, well, maybe we can't. Maybe we can factor, maybe we can't. But this is a quadratic, and we know how to handle quadratics. First, we could try factor. OK. The Factors of negative 1 are, uh, well, 1 and negative 1. None of those add up to negative 10, so we actually can't. Oh, never mind. So much for that. And whenever you can't factor, your other options are uh, completing the square or the 
quadratic form. Let's use the quadratic form. Let's see, the quadratic formula, someone's coming in. Attendance, make sure they are counted, present. There we go. So, using the quadratic formula, this would be, let's see, the quadratic formula says that our variable, usually x, but here's w, is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Okay. Cool. So our b is negative 10. Let's see, negative 10 squared is 100, minus 4 times 1 times negative 1, so that's 100 plus 4, so it's going to be the square root of 100. All over 2 times 1 is 2, all over 2. All right, cool. But this itself will further simplify out. 10 divided by 2 is And the square root of 104 this will actually simplify let's see the square root of 104 uh, 100 is in 4 is a uh, 4 times 26 square root of 4 is 2 so we could actually rewrite the square root of 104 2 square root 26. That 2 divided by that 2 cancels. So we end up with 5 plus or minus the square root of 26. All right. So that means wherever our w was e to the x, right? Which means that e to the x is equal to 5 plus or minus the square root of 26. All right, now one more thing. Now, the square root of 26 is greater than five. So five minus the, so five, uh, minus the square root of 26, that's negative. And an exponential is never negative. That's something that we learned. It's always above the x-axis. So we could ignore that negative. So, So e to the x is equal to 5 plus the square root of 26. Now, on this right side, 5 plus the square root of 26, that will just give us a number. It's a bit of a, it, this will, this, there's no variables over here, which means now we can use the form change formula to rewrite this. as a log base e of 5 plus the square root of 26 equals x. Ah, but remember that a log of base e, we have a special name for that. We call it the natural log. And so we end up with the natural log of 5 plus the square root of 26 equals x. All right then. So stick that number in a calculator or stick natural log of uh, 5 plus square root of 26. Do a calculator here. And we get 2.3.
<sighs> you did it. Yay! So what do you think? Was that easy or was that a pain in the butt? Yeah, that was awful, wasn't it? We did get there, but it was awful. I do have good news, though. There's an easier way. <laughs> yeah, this was awful. This was terrible, horrible. But we have an easier way. Now, remember that we've actually solved equations by graphing in the past. And we can do that here. To solve an equation by graphing, you simply graph each side and see where they cross. So let's take, so, uh, Also, graph each side. And see where they cross. Now, when I say each side, I mean that we're graphing y equals e to the x minus e to the negative x all over 2. And we're also graphing y equals 5. And when I say where they cross, I mean we're looking for the x-axis, or the, the uh, x-coordinate of the x-axis. OK, let's go to Desmos. OK, so we have. Well, we need to graph the left side. Y equals e to the x minus e to the negative x all over 2. Oh, that's not all over at all. Okay, so it looks like I need to write that a little bit. OK. e to the x minus e to the negative x all over 2. Okay, good, there we go, okay, okay. Yeah, all right. Now, y equals five. Okay, so there we go, we've graphed them. Now, let's go ahead and see where they cross. 2.31, look at that. A little easier, isn't it? Instead of taking us 15 minutes and needing to use the quadratic, the quadratic formula, we just took 30 seconds to graph each side, and Desmos just told the truth. So, Both of these methods work, and both of these are things that are useful to know. But honestly, in real life context, if you're the if you're doing something, if I'm doing something for work, and we solve some kind of equation, which does happen more than you might think, then doing it by hand is frequently pretty awful when I could do this and get the result in a fraction of time. OK, 
okay, do you think you can do one yourself? And I don't mean one of these, I mean one of these. Do you think you can solve one by graphing on your own? All right, I'm gonna go ahead and give you one and uh, for you to try yourself. I would like you to solve the natural log, and that's ln. I'll show you how to plug it into decimals in a minute. Uh, this is ln of 3x minus 2 plus ln of x minus 1 equals 2 ln of x. I want you to solve it by graphing each side and finding where they cross. Okay. So I'm gonna run them run back over to Desmos for just a minute to show you how to plug in the elements. Okay, close. Okay, so first of all, if you're using if you're using a keyboard, then you can just type L and it's far enough to do that. I'll turn it into an natural log and you can put zero three. If you're using like a phone or a tablet for Desmos and you don't have a full keyboard. Then you can also find natural log by clicking on the functions button, going to MISC, then choosing this LN here, natural log. So natural log of 3x minus 2, close the parentheses, it needs to be plus. You know what? I'm not going to do this for you. You, you. you do it yourself. Okay, so graph each side and find where they cross. I'll give you guys about 90 seconds.
<laughs> okay. So, anyone have an answer? You can type it into your into the private chat if you want. So, you need to graph each side. The left side is natural log of 3x minus 2 plus natural log of x minus 1. The right side is y equals natural log, that's ln, of x. Where, where do they cross? Oh, oops. The right side here I have should be two n of x. There we go. There we go. Our x value. Is two. So that wasn't so bad, was it? Graph each side, see where they cross, and that will solve you that equation. And honestly, that'll solve you every equation of one variable. If you have multiple variables, then it won't work. Uh, but this will solve you basically any equation, not just ones with exponentials and logarithms. All right. So. <laughs> Sorry. Now, before we uh, move on to the next topic or to the next subject, I did, do think it would be kind of interesting to talk about very briefly how we would actually solve this. Now, the way we would solve this it would actually be with the property. We know that the natural log of 3x minus 2 plus the natural log of x minus 1, we're adding two logs of the same base, which means that we can multiply the inside. So we rewrite the left side as the natural log of 3x minus 2 times x minus 4. On the right side, we can use the properties of logarithms to move this to back into the equation, we would get the natural log of x squared. Well, now we can use the one-to-one -one property. And now we would have 3x minus 2 times x minus 1 is x squared, which is a quadratic. At least I believe it's a quadratic. Thank you. Yeah, it's a quadratic. So this would give us a quadratic, so we could tackle this with a quadratic form. With a number of other things. But, you know, that would involve a lot of dis distributing, and it would be a little bit ugly. And it wouldn't be that bad. It would be doable. But so much faster just to grab each side and call it a day. All right. Okay. So there's one last thing I want to talk about in this uh, discussion of this discussion of uh, such things. I wanted to discuss orders of magnitude. Thank you. 
let's talk about orders. Dude. So. Real life especially scientific applications. Oh, God. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Real life often has very wide ranges of numbers. So for example, the planet Mercury is about five point seven nine times ten to the ten meters from the sun. That's about uh fifty seven. That's a that's about uh fifty seven minutes. This is in scientific notation because I don't think you really want me to write five seven nine zero 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 seven zero zero. Pluto, so uh, Mercury is 5.79 times 10 to the 10 meters from the sun. That's about 57 billion. Pluto is, uh, that should be 5 point, I'm sorry. No, 9 billion. And Pluto is about 5.9 times 10 to the 12 meters from the sun. That's about 5.9 trillion. So, now these numbers are fit, are very far apart. The difference between 5.9 trillion and 5.79 billion is about 5.9 trillion. So talking about them in terms of the difference between them, like this minus that, is not really very useful. But it can be useful to talk about to talk about the difference between their law. Okay. So a common logarithm
the number is its order of magnitude. We're just so let's find the order of magnitude of each of these differences. So we have five point seven nine times ten to the ten. So if I find the log of 5.79 times 10 to the 10. And remember it says common log in common logarithm. So that's the uh, log base 10. And that gives us about 10.7. So the log of 5.79 times 10 to the 10 is about 0.76. Where's the log of 5.9 times 10 to the 12? is 12.77. Seems easy enough. So to find the order of magnitude of a number, just find all you need to do is just uh, all you, yeah. so to find the order of magnitude, to find the order of magnitude of a uh, of a number, you simply find its log. It's common. Now, very often, we're not necessarily interested in the absolute magnitude of the number itself, uh, or the order of magnitude, sorry, not absolute magnitude, the order of magnitude of the number itself, as much as we're interested in the difference between the orders of magnitude. So, what is the difference between 10.77 and 10.76? Well, that's about two. And again, and again, uh, it's not just the difference of orders of magnitude we care about, it's kind of the nearest whole number. And it's not really because, there, because it tells us anything specific as much as it provides a useful shorthand for talking about really big numbers. For example, the difference between the order of magnitude of a thousand and ten, that's a difference of two, because that is a, the log of a thousand is three or three minus well, three minus one is two. So we care about the difference between the orders of magnitude rather than we care about the orders of magnitude themselves. 
So in this case, we would say the distance to Pluto is two orders of magnitude greater than the distance to Mercury. Y2 because the difference between these numbers is about 2. Fair enough. Now, these orders of magnitude are actually really important in scientific applications because they're such a great big wide, because they're, the differences between the greatest, the biggest phenomena and the smallest phenomena is so gigantic that it is much more useful to take the logs of the absolute numbers and work with those. Just uh, for an example off the top of my head. Uh, decibels, measures of loudness. The difference between a very quiet noise between the tiniest whisper and a very loud noise can be very, very wide indeed, especially if we're talking about the difference between a whisper and like a rock. So the decibel scale is a, is a logarithmic scale, or going up by one decibel means you're actually go means you're actually going up by an order of magnitude. Two decimals is ten times louder than one decibel. Earthquakes work in a similar way. The Richter scale for measuring how powerful earthquakes are is, a, uh, is an order of magnitude scale, where the difference between a magnitude six and a magnitude eight earthquake, a magnitude eight earthquake is about 100 times as powerful as a magnitude six earthquake. So is um, uh, the pH scale for measuring acidity and acidity and thickness. That is a logarithmic scale. It's used frequently in astronomy. The I share my screen with you for just a moment. This scale is called the Hertzsprung Russell diagram. For this, and that's what the, this picture is called. And the Hertzsprung Russell diagram is made just by charting all of the stars in the sky based on their based on their color. Their color is determined by temperature. That's why it's using temperature here along the top. And on this y-axis using the brightness of the star or the brightness of the sun. So the sun is right in here. Okay. Now note that for each tick mark, 
it multiplies by 10. These stars are 10 times brighter than these stars. These stars are 100,000 times brighter than these stars. So this is also, so when each time we move up a tick mark, we're moving up an order of magnitude. All right. Now, kind of the bottom line is that when to go up an order of magnitude, you multiply by 10. So when you go up five orders of magnitude, you're multiplying by 10. Really not that particularly difficult. But to find the order of magnitude, you simply take the log. All right, well, I think that that was about everything I wanted to talk about. So I know that we're ending a little bit early, about five minutes early. So uh, I will see you guys. So I will see you guys tomorrow. I will upload a check for understanding. Probably one problem where you solve a logarithm, a uh, like exponential or a logarithmic equation by doing it by hand, and probably another problem where you have to do it by graphing. And I will see you guys tomorrow. Have a great day.